I want you to go back, Beto, and look at how far you've come. I think you'll probably be very surprised. And that glass ceiling that we hit, it's becoming the floor you stand on. And when you go back and you look, I'll bet you on every one of those things that you did, the ceiling you were going for is now the floor you were standing on. And it's because you put a new ceiling there. And so you are growing. You also reminded me of a story about Oprah Winfrey. She said she was sitting there to her grandmother who she lived with was uh, hanging out clothes. And she was teaching Oprah how to hang the clothes. So when they come off the line, they weren't as wrinkled, which meant you didn't have to spend so much time ironing them. Well, Oprah said she sat there and she watched and she learned. And all the time she kept saying, I will never be doing that for somebody. He only asked for 10%. He gives us 100%. Yet a lot of people go, oh, I'll give when I make more money. Well, no, you make more money when you give. It's a promise. Like my grandson said one day to, uh, we were discussing all of this, and he says, "Uh, Grandma, you can live your life as an example or you can live it as a warning. Which way are you going to live it? That's what we get to choose every single day. Are you a player or are you a pretender? That's right, my friends. I'm Beto Gudinho. Welcome to another episode of ChristianPodcast.com. I'm your host, Beto Gudinho. I'm from Guadalajara, Mexico, but I live here in Southern California, Costa Mesa. Say it with me, Costa Mesa, California. Today, yes, (laughs) today we have a special guest. (laughs) We're going to talk about a little bit of this idea of confronting the prosperity gospel. Okay, and this is based on some articles that I've been reading lately. I think it was on Relevant Magazine where it says that a majority of the younger Christians believe in the prosperity gospel. Okay, so I think there's something to that. And I'm not saying this is an ambassador of the prosperity gospel today. But nonetheless, she's got a book that's called Becoming More. Her name is Diana Kakowska. Welcome to the show, Diana. How are you doing? (laughs) I am doing great, Beto. Thank you so much for having me here. I just love the fact that podcasts and people listen to them. And so, Beto, I appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Super excited. And just by the way, I mean, this book has a foreword by John C. Maxwell, like the epitome of leadership in America and basically in the whole world. Right. So how cool is that? So let's kick off today's episode with an emoji reaction. You guys ready? So we're going to the Belifo meter and we'll see the reaction for today is the holy emoji. Holy emoji, that's not very often that we have a holy emoji on the show. So Diana, uh, let's get back to you. What's the idea behind the holy emoji today? Well, the fact of it is, is so many people, Beto, are, they're out there, they're anxious, they're into depression, a lot of them, and they're not certain exactly what to do. They not, they're not certain of their emotions. And literally, uh, in my book, I have Dr. Feldman Be- uh, Barrett, who literally is from Northwestern University, and she says that our reactions to anxiety and things like that are not based upon external events. They're based upon the stories that we make up around external events. See, our brains work in such a way that we've trained it to literally be the brain that it is. And most of us think our brain does the thinking for us. We actually determine the thinking we desire and train our brain to think that way. So we have an experience and what happens is our brain goes through like a filing cabinet. 
it's called the maps that we have in our brain. But it's like going through a filing cabinet and picking out all the items that actually maybe you've had before that relate to that experience. Now, based upon that, we instantly make up a judgment and we're judging machines. We can't help it. I mean, we like this. We don't like that. We like the taste of this. We don't like the taste of that. We walk into a store. We like that dress or we don't like the dress. We like the pants. We don't like the pants. I mean, we're just constantly judging. And once we make a judgment, our brain makes a story around that judgment. And because we love to look good and be right, our brain says, that's what I'm going to do for you. There's a part of the brain called the reticular activating system, RAS for short, R-A-S. And this RAS is like your Google search engine. You go to your computer, you tell your computer what it is that you desire, and all those blue things come up. It doesn't show you everything that's on the computer. It couldn't. It just shows you the things you're asking for. Well, that's what the reticular activating system does for us. It only shows us what we tell it to show us. The eyes can only see and the ears can only hear what the mind tells it to is what Dan Sullivan says. And he's right, because if you say the world is a terrible place, it's going to show you all the terrible things in the world. And something great can be happening next to you. It's not going to show you because you don't want to see it. And once we make up a story and it shows us, it helps us predict our future to continue to make that story a reality. Now, here's the fun part about it is we get to make up the story. Some stories are going to make us happy. Some stories are going to make us sad. But we make up the story we desire to actually think about. When we put our focus on knowing that there's a God out there, knowing that he is with us, knowing that he is always there knocking at the door. We just have to let him in. That's a great story, a story that makes our life come alive, gives us passion and purpose. Yet, if we make up a story that nobody cares about us, nobody's there for us, we're going to continue to live out that story and prove ourselves right, like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Wow, that's so good. There's so much in what you said right there. And I, I mean, I have so many questions, right? But I think... Basically, what you just said, and I love it, you know, you're, you're including, you know, like brain facts. So there's some science to this. And, and I think basically, like, to me, the, the, the big idea of what you're saying is kind of like what you think you become. And I've heard that again and again. And I think there's so much truth to that. And I also believe the idea of like storylines and then where do we step in even in our own story and where do we kind of like are aware of our own choices And even like owning our story and our and our past, right? Because sometimes our past and, and our bad or poor choices in the past have gotten us to where we are. And even in the midst of maybe that anxiety or hopelessness of or, or chaotic situation we might be in, what you're saying is we can we can still choose a better outcome or choose to change. <laughs> so I mean there's some power to that. And overall, I think almost what you just described it's also what some people might call the prosperity gospel like the idea that uh there's a god who wants what's best for me and i, I think most people would agree with that right if there's a good god why wouldn't right. he want good things for us and even when we read scripture i mean there's that that verse in jeremiah that's super i mean i i guess everybody that's a christian like knows this this verse that says you know i know the plans that i have for you plans to prosper to give you a future and a hope and i know it's tied to a context and i know it's tied to you know like seeking the prosperity of the city and things like that because i've heard it all you know i've heard the pastor say you know you gotta put that in context and not taking out of context and stuff like that so i totally get that but at the same time uh this is what i was reading in a like i said in a relevant magazine that most christians nowadays kind of like believe in this prosperity gospel and i think that's that's almost like this desire of i want to believe that there's a god that wants good things for me if i'm going to be his 
child, why wouldn't he mm-hmm. want good things for me? Just as a parent wants good things for his kids, right? So what do you have to say to that? Like when you hear prosperity gospel, is that strike you as that um that's 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 a wrong name maybe for it? Do you do you relate to that at all? Do you see have people even push back to you with that that same thought? Well, that's a great question. And see, I do believe that God wants us to prosper. I do believe that He says, I want the best for you, because you you said it your best at the best. Uh, you said that He's that we're a child of God and He's our Father. So why wouldn't He want the best for us? I mean, you don't wish bad things on your children. So yes, I mean, the prayer of Jabez is a great one. He asked for more. Now he asked for more, literally those blessings so he could give to others. If if we're just asking all for ourselves, I mean, God isn't our genie. Hey, my wish is your command, so to speak. Yet, are we willing to go out and share with the world? Are we willing? uh, you, You said choice, and this is what hit me. You know, we live our life between B, which stands for birth, and D, which stands for death. And if we're between B and D, that's C. And C stands for choice. And every time we turn around, everything is a choice. We are the co-creator, the character, the crusader, and the champion of our own story. And so prosperity is a story that we can help construct with God's help. Yet, how do we pray? Do we pray just for ourselves? Or do we pray for us to be someone that has the eyes to see who needs to be helped, the ears to hear what needs to be done in the world, and to be stand, you know, to stand up for. Do we stand up for people's greatness more than they stand for their limitations? Do we help people find what's right, not by just uh, constantly judging and telling them what's wrong? It's about finding what's right. It's about building on what's right. And it's about believing that God wants the best for us to find the best for us. But we got to do our part. We just can't say, hey, it's all up to you. We've got to do our part in becoming more so we can do more, so we can have more, so we can ultimately give more. And Beto, a lot of people think, well, if I have what somebody has, I will then be able to do what they do and then I can be like them. That's the wrong philosophy. That's the philosophy of a victim. I have to have what you have to do what you do. No. Some people say, well, I just have to do more. The more I do, then the more I'll have, and then I can be the person I always want to be. And that's kind of like a villain wanting to do, 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 right? It's literally to become the hero of our own life and allow Mm. God to come in We have to grow. We have to become more so we can do more, so we can have more and ultimately give more back. I hope that helps answer the question that you asked me. I I just so believe in we grow into opportunity. We don't go into opportunity. And John Maxwell, who you brought up, that did the foreword for my book, he's been my mentor for 25 years now. I've been on trips to Guatemala with him, to Honduras, to uh, he's been in Costa Rica. We've been to Dominican Republic, Brazil, uh, Paraguay. I mean, so many places teaching values, meeting with presidents and prime ministers to have them put into the Constitution where kids take a value class, just like they take math. South Carolina implemented this, and Beto, it's so fabulous. The bullying went down 27% in just one year. We're working diligently to get this throughout the schools in America because values, that's what we're talking about. Values Mm -hmm. mean so much. And when we have great values, we either have values that limit us or liberate us. Mm. Wow. So what do we want in our life? I know I went in some different directions there, yet I just spoke what was on my heart. No, I love it. I love, I love, I mean, yes, 
uh, I think I guess I'm going to stick a little bit to that idea of values. Uh, but also, I mean, I love some some stuff you said. You mentioned we we gotta kind of like become the hero of our own stories. So I want to get to that yeah. too because that's I mean that's very profound. <laughs> and then you also mentioned like finding what's right, right? And I think your book is called Becoming More. But before we move on to like those deep thoughts and ideas of the values, I just want to wrestle a little bit more on this idea of of. Um, maybe victimhood and prosperity and i see it because mm. i'm a i'm a believer right like i read scripture and to me it's yeah. evident that god has a heart for people and especially particularly for for people that uh i mean this is super hard to say because i like i agree with you, you we gotta own our story but there's also what i witness as maybe like injustices or injustice that happens throughout history where I do feel like some people are are oppressed by maybe a system or by a set of values, maybe even by, by our own set of values, right? Which, which is kind of like falling into that victimhood mentality. But, but I also see a little bit of like God validating their journey and their story. And especially like you read, no, the old Testament is all about, um, kind of like helping the marginalized and uh, doing it for the sense of like the bigger community and bringing your, you know, the first fruit so that, you know, everybody will have plentiful in the house of the Lord, things like that. Right. And then you go to like the book of, of James in particular, where it says you guys have affronted the poor and it says you guys give the best places for the people that are well dressed and when they come to the synagogues you put them in the front and you kind of like welcome in so i i mean i feel like that's that idea of like okay if you have more or if you show yourself as like on a higher status you get a better place and then james confronts this this these followers of Jesus and says it shouldn't be like that. You shouldn't, you know, make the poor feel unwelcome and cast him out because he's less than. So I'm gonna bring a story to kind of like what I've witnessed here in America because I, I come from Mexico, but I've been here 18 years already, and my first job had been in construction for many years. So what I notice, it's a lot of um, Mexican people or Latin American people working really hard usually in the construction jobs in the you know the food industry the cooks the chefs the, the people that help out in the mostly before covid right people that were in the the hospitality industry working in hotels and you no know, cleaning rooms and things like that and it's mostly people from latin america especially here in california right i'm sure it's maybe different in other places of the U.S. and even in other places of the world. But all that to say, um, I do have witnessed a little bit of that maybe oppressive spirit when it comes to, you know, people of, of lower income. And I do feel like there's some unfairness, not, not really victimhood mentality, because I think most of the people are here to work and they're here to say, you know, even if I'm getting, getting paid less, this is what's fair, right? And I get my fair share. But I just feel like some people take advantage of that. You know, people maybe on the higher levels take advantage of that. And, you know, they're living a really large life thanks to all these people that are just working hard, you know? And that's kind of like the reality of my city where I live. It's Costa Mesa. And it's where all the Latino lives. And Newport Beach is where, you know, the, the rich people live. And guess where all the workers live? In Costa Mesa and guess they where work? In Newport Beach, right? Doing the construction, the landscape, the food, like all of those. So that's my last comment on what what's your vantage point when it comes to people encountering that, that oppressiveness? Um, because I feel also like I, I tell my kids sometimes, you know, because uh, I take him um, this kind of like different story, but I'm teaching them the values of and the work ethic of hard work, right? So every Saturday I take him to do just kind of like cleaning and that type of job in, in somewhere in Corona del Mar because I have a connection there. Um, and I'm just teaching them that value of, hey, you work hard, you do what's asked and required, and you clean the poop of the birds on the docks and things like that, right? Uh, but I also tell them, 
This is not what you have to do the rest of your life. I just want to teach you work ethic, okay? But I also recognize that those jobs need to be done, right? So there's always going to be somebody that is going to kind of like be doing those jobs. So what do you have to say to, to that idea? I, I feel like in, in a sense, you know, Jesus said, you're always going to have the poor. Um, so I'm like, that's, that's, that's kind of true. You're always going to have people who... You know, are are needed for those type of jobs, and maybe they're not going to be rich, right? They're not going to make become more in that sense. So, what do you have? I mean, that's kind of like a long, uh, no, winding story <laughs> to 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 these questions. But what do you have to say to that? Have you witnessed that? What's your vantage point? Well, first of all, uh, I am in Texas, so yes, mm. I've witnessed a lot of that, and I I believe that when you value people you value people. Doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter how much they make. So I'm going to say two things here. First off, I climbed up to be a CEO, okay? I started not being able to afford a babysitter, went into real estate, put my kids in a little red radio flyer wagon and took them door to door as I met people to see if I could sell their home. So I've been without As as I started growing and being Italian uh, in the area that I was in was very much like what you're describing. I, I didn't know what a WAP was or a Dago. I just knew they called me that. It was okay. Uh, and we made fun of it, right? We made jokes about it. And I always believed, though, I would be more. Now, I went on to become a CEO, and you think this is about me. It isn't. It's when I stepped down from being a CEO, I experienced what you're talking about. As a CEO, Beto, they, oh my goodness, they would bring me tea. They would, what can I help you with? They would carry my briefcase. They would do whatever I needed. And, and it was like, oh no. And I would always say, no, I'm just like you. Put on my pants the same way as you do and always honoring them. Then... I stepped down from being a CEO. You know, most of those people don't even come around me anymore. They don't even talk. And it's okay because I realize they needed to get ahead and I could help them. And that's what I was here for. Now, I'm going to take you back, though, to some of the work that we have done even around our house. The lady that I love tremendously, I love her family. She comes in and cleans my house. Melissa is her name. She's fabulous. She worked for someone that makes billions of dollars. I mean, they're almost a billionaire, I should say, makes millions. And she's always telling me the way I'm treated here is so much different than the way I was treated there. I said, well, What do you mean? And she says, I'm valued here. So I want our listeners to hear when we value people, we value all people. We don't pick and choose who we're going to value because then when we pick and choose and treat people that make money better than those that don't make a lot of money or don't have a lot of money, that says we're valuing ourselves more than people. Well, How can you be a Christian and be Christ-like? He valued everyone. He spent more time with the sinners. I mean, after all, if you're a Christian, I can't convert you. I got to go out to convert other people, which means I have to value them all. I have to be kind to them all. You also reminded me of a story about Oprah Winfrey. She said she was sitting there And her grandmother, who she lived with, was uh, hanging out clothes. And she was teaching Oprah how to hang the clothes. So when they come off the line, they weren't as wrinkled, right? Which meant you didn't have to spend so much time ironing them. Well, Oprah said she sat there and she watched and she learned. And all the time she kept saying, I will never be doing that for somebody. She made up her mind to choose a different story. It was a defining moment. She had many defining moments. They wanted her to call her name Susie, 
and change her name to Susan, I should say, versus Oprah, because they said no one would remember Oprah. But we all remember Oprah. I mean, think about the things that people, the labels they want to put on us. We're the ones, though, that either accept them or decline them. See, in every story, there is a victim, a villain, a hero, and some stories have coaches and mentors. Yet I'm here to say, they may cast us into a position, but we have to either accept that character or change it. It's up to us, nobody else. If they put me in the victim role, I'm the one in my mind that has to say, you may treat me that way, but that is not who I am. And it's up to us to train our brain to become more. That's why the book literally gives us a step by step guide on how to train our brain through our thoughts, our beliefs, our values, our emotions, our mindset, our perspective, the words that we use, the character that we become, and the goals that we set, our personal development, the energy that we carry with us. And we, through all of that, can build a new story for ourselves. And the last thing I want to touch on is people, it's not about money that makes us rich. Because I know a lot of people that don't make much money, Beto, and they are much richer than the people that do. Some people live in those houses that are fabulous and they make a lot of money and, oh my goodness, they have so many things, but they're empty inside. And they know they're empty. It's the people that know Jesus Christ, that accept him, that are rich in so many ways. And yes, money helps us. Let's face it. We can't do anything without money. Yet money is good for the good it can do. And so I believe a lot of people that don't have money are much richer than those that do have it. Wow. That's profound. Okay, so let's let's walk through those becoming more but based on values because I, I think what i'm hearing you say is that becoming more is not necessarily about be- becoming richer right economically no. even though uh, i guess god is not against that either right but but you have mentioned values you have mentioned value people the same like it doesn't matter who they are and i loved your example of um Christ spent so much time with the sinners, right? Even that he was accused by 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 the yeah. the religious people of his time because of that same thing. You know, you're spending too too much time with the sinners, right? And I mean, for sure, Jesus uh, uh, he 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 brought up this phrase that's epic, right? When he says, you know, it's the it's the sick who need a medic, right? So I, I mean, right. I love all that idea. So what you're saying, it's almost like there's a um, there's a need like what what would you say is that becoming more like what is the where do we find ourselves before becoming more like what, what is it about our life that we we feel empty like how would you describe like even as you describe people who are maybe rich in you know in money but still poor on the inside what are maybe some of those descriptors that can help us understand where we're at in life and whether maybe we we lack you know, resources but we might be rich already what can you point people to to acknowledge this is really your situation before becoming more this is where you're at well it's a very good question because every one of us have a story the story that we are currently living in our life. And we've made up that story because of our thoughts, our beliefs, our values, and our emotions, right? They all come together to make up this thing called mindset, which lives in our subconscious mind. Our attitude is different. The attitude is in the conscious mind, and the mindset is in the unconscious mind. So when you look at that, And you've got to have the conscious mind is your goal setter and the subconscious mind is your goal getter. And these two have to be in alignment. You have to line those two up. So how do you know where you are? Well, when you order the book, Becoming More, right? 
if you if you order it before October 31st, you actually get a free assessment. And this assessment tells you where your mindset is currently. And of course, it's one that I made up. I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist and all of that, yet it gives you an idea. You're the only one that gets the report, so you don't have to worry about that. But you get a booklet saying how much of your mindset is towards scarcity, how much is towards abundance. And then I give decision points, little things that you can do to move from scarcity to abundance. And see, I believe that God does want us to live an abundant life. After all, look at the world. He's made it abundant. You can't count the leaves on a tree in the summertime or or since you're in California, the sand on the beaches. We can't begin to count all the abundance in our life that God provides. So what is it about us that we refuse the abundance that he's willing to give us? One of the things that he gives to us is the money that we make. Yet how many people, he only asks for 10%. He gives us 100% and he asks for 10% back. Yet a lot of people go, oh, I'll give when I make more money. Well, no, you make more money when you give. It's a promise. If he's a perfect God, then that means he's perfect. So if he says, I will bless you abundantly, when you tithe, then that's a promise. And so I think a lot of the things that we're talking about here is our thought process. You know, Roy ba- uh, Roy Disney said, it's easy to make decisions when you know your values. Mm-hmm. So what are your values? If you, if you value God, then you're going to give a minimum of 10% back. And uh, it reminds me one time, uh, John Maxwell had it set up. He was preaching in church one day, and it was all a setup, yet we didn't know it. And he said, you know, oh my goodness, I told the pastor I would take him out to lunch after the services, and and I I forgot my wallet. Does does anybody have a $100 bill that they could just loan me? And I promise I'll pay you back, right? So, I mean, I'm getting in my purse. Another guy just hands it to him, and he goes, thank you. And he goes on and he preaches. And then he comes back and he says at the end, he says, you know what? I played a trick on all of you. He said, the $100 bill that Ron gave me, I actually gave it to him before the service started. I just asked him back for my own money. And so he gave it back to me because it was mine. So I didn't borrow it from him. And Ron goes, yeah, yeah, it was all a setup. And he goes, yet that's how God is. Are you living your life to where you'll give him back the money he gave you? And all he asks is for 10%. So it starts with the thought process. How are we thinking? Is it our money or is it God's money? When it comes to our life, how are we thinking? Do we think and then believe? I have a statement In fact, I have over 100 affirmations they can get when they buy the book as well. It's free. And it's the statement is, what I believe about myself is who I will become. So I believe the very best of myself. Are we doing that? It's a thought process turned into a belief. Then that belief gives us the value, the energy, and the character of confidence. So see, everything builds upon another. Every little thing that we do builds and projects us towards our future. And I don't care what your past is. Uh, Thinking about your past is like driving forward in your car, looking in the rearview mirror. You can't do it. We've got to leave our past in our past. I mean, God tells us, repent every day. Repent of what you did bad yesterday and work to be better today. That's what it is about becoming more. It's about who you're being today and advancing to becoming more tomorrow. Michael Jordan is a great example of that. He didn't make the basketball team. (laughs) I mean, he said he put a picture or a copy of that in his locker. Every before every game, he looked at it, reminding himself 
He didn't make the basketball team. It's up to him to improve. It's up to him to become better. And every listener out there has that opportunity. It's a promise that God gave us that we can build ourselves into a better person. He's there to help us. He's there to guide us when we when we read his word. He gives it to us. He tells us about the character that we should have, that it should be strong and deep-rooted like a tree next to the water grows bigger than one that's away from the water. Keep keep us close to God. He he tells us in his word who we can become and literally tells us how to do that. He tells us that our words are the rudder to the ship of our life, that our tongue helps predict our future. Are we literally listening to his words, reading his words, and taking them into our own life? And that's pretty much what I did with this book. This is biblical-based. Even though I don't quote scripture in it, It's written in a way that, like, are you a player or a pretender? Like my grandson said one day to, uh, we were discussing all of this, and he says, "Uh, Grandma, you can live your life as an example or you can live it as a warning. Which way are you going to live it? Mm. That's what we get to choose every single day. Are you a player or are you a pretender? A player gets into the word. A player strives to live the word. A player wants to increase 1% or more like Michael Jordan every day to become the very best that they can be. Mm -hmm. That's all. Are we doing that? Wow. Uh, Yes, I I guess that's a reference to Atomic Habits. I read that book too where, you know, kind of like increase the 1% uh, on a daily basis and I mean, there's 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 so much in what you're saying, you know. And I think the I love that idea of like owning the story and kind of like I think you know what you just describe. It's almost like becoming the hero in your own story, right? So going from that uh, that thought process in your mind, and I love what you mentioned about the mindset in the unconscious and the attitude of the conscious, and then kind of like bringing those together. I mean, that's super profound and it makes so much sense. I'm going to tell you why, at least on my end, why I feel like it makes so much sense as a follower of Jesus, because Jesus has an encounter with Nicodemus and Nicodemus is a a religious leader, right? Like he knows the word in a sense, he knows scripture. And when they're talking, uh, Jesus says, it's necessary for you to be born again. And then Nicodemus is kind of like uh, blown away. Like, how can I go back to my mother's womb? I'm an old man or older man. Like, that's impossible, right? And Jesus says, unless you're born of the spirit and water, I think he mentions, um, right? You, you, you won't be inheriting the kingdom. I think he says something like that, right? And then, I mean, John 3.16, John 3.17. So, I mean, that's that's epic. But that idea itself of almost like what you mentioned, like the thought process, because it's an invitation from Jesus himself to say, this life is not about what you mentioned at the beginning, right? Like the B to D, right? The birth to death. There's an in-between, and the in-between is the choice. So that's what rings so much truth, at least in my brain, about what you said, you know, because Jesus does make that invitation to, regardless of where you're at in life, there's still a choice you need to make. And I think what, I, I guess my question would be, what has been helpful for you in your journey to to answer that question, to become the hero of your story, maybe if you can make it personal, because I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure it's personal for you, right? Because uh, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, like carrying the, the radio flyer with your kids and becoming a, a real estate person and not not uh, being able to afford a nanny. I mean, that for you is kind of like the, the, some of maybe the stepping stones, the, the, the mind shift comes out of that, right? But... If you could say maybe what was your why once you were faced with this question of it's necessary for you to be born again, to think differently, to 
to you know change your mind right is what paul says too in uh uh i think it's romans when it says do not conform to the patterns of this world but renew no, your mind so i mean there's so much to that but let's make it personal what was it about you diana in your own journey well one of the things that i, I want to really go back to for just a moment because i loved what you said beto and nicodemus remember jesus said follow me and he chose not to that was a choice that literally altered his life and I'm not here to say good or bad. I mean, he was older, uh, lots of things. It had to be a very difficult choice for him. Yet it was a choice. And every one of us, we have choices every single day, thousands of choices that we need to make. So what was it that about me, you said, about becoming the hero of my own life? Well, first of all, uh, it actually hit my brain when my grandmother was reading a story to me. It was when I was very young. And uh, it was David Copperfield. And of course, you put yourself into the story as they're reading it. And you're right there with David Copperfield. And he said, whether I am to be the hero of my own life, my life will tell. And those aren't the exact words, yet it was something about being the hero of his own life. Up until then, I just knew about heroes of other people's lives, like Superman and mm. uh, Captain America, and of course, Wonder Woman. I grabbed hold of because she had the same name as mine, Diana, and she was the only woman hero that I knew. So I thought, how could I be more like Wonder Woman with the lasso of truth, helping people. And that's when I decided that I was to add value. I don't know if it was as clear to me back then, yet it was, I knew my why was to add value to people. Now, my phone, and before my phone, it was actually printed in my schedule. At 7 a.m., my phone has an alarm that goes off, and it says, what will you do today to add value to people? And at 7 p.m., it goes off, and it says, what did you do today to add value to people? And you've helped me with that, Beto, to add value. I trust that something I've said hits a chord somewhere with someone to add value to them. That why of adding value propels me. My brother and sister both had brain tumors. Mm. And because I wanted to add value, I started studying the brain. Now, this was back in uh, when neuroscience was in its infancy. I mean, the Yale uh, Therapeutic uh, Division had just opened up, and nobody knew that much about the brain. My brother was sent home. They didn't have rehab centers and all of that. He had to learn how to walk and talk four different times in his life. And the first time, my mom bought this reel-to-reel. -reel. A lot of the, <laughs> the people listening won't even know what I'm talking about. It's a great big box that had a reel on one side and a reel on the other. And the tape went through it, and it recorded. And I would say a word, and he would say the word. And then I would rewind the tape and play it back so he could hear himself. I learned at that point that in life, we learn things, we implement things, we fail at them, we learn a new way, and we continually go around the circle. Learn, implement, fail, relearn, learn, implement, fail. That's life. It's going to throw us ups and downs, roller coaster. That's what life is. Well, my brother did learn how to talk. Then he had a stroke, had to learn again. Wow. Then something happened with the brain tumor. He had, a, They had to cut the shunt because of a kidney transplant. He went into a coma. He was in a coma for months. We wouldn't, we wouldn't let him stop the life support. And he came out of it. Wow. Literally, my my sister had a brain tumor, and hers was behind the optical nerve. She couldn't complete the sentences. Her thoughts would stop midstream. And we played charades to figure out what she wanted to say. Here's where I'm going with all of this. Both of them did not let nature or life 
put them down. Neither one of them ever stopped working to become more. It was a choice that they made. They didn't say, oh, look at me. I mean, after all, hips are being replaced. My husband had two hip replacements. Nature said, you don't have good hips. He got new ones. And he went through the struggle of walking again the right way. And people say, oh, something happens to them and they have anxiety and they struggle. Struggle's part of life. Open yourself up to it. And once you open yourself up to it, you can get through it with God's help. So why? To add value. Two, how do I do that? Every day. I look for it. Mm. I listen for it. I work to do it because it's my focus and what you focus on expands. I don't know what your passion or your why is. Whatever it is, I know God put a dream in your heart. You wouldn't have that dream if he hadn't helped put it there. And he's given you a gift to help you find it. The question is, have you opened the gift up? Hmm. A lot of people walk around with their gift, not believing in themselves enough to open it, not believing in themselves enough to give it not believing in themselves enough to speak about it. Because when we speak about things, it comes find us. Speak about beauty, beauty finds you. Speak about greatness. Here's something I want our listeners to know, and I'm kind of taking us off track, I understand, yet I think it's important because it's come to me three times, so I know it needs to be mm -hmm. said. Dr. Daniel Amen did a study. I, I've looked at a lot of brain scans, even had my own brain scan to figure out what, what our brain is like. But he brought 30 people in and he talked to them about gratitude. And they wrote for five minutes things they were grateful for. Uh, hot water, hot water pressure, a, a shower, a sunlight, roses. I don't care what it was. They just wrote. Then they waited 30 minutes and they did brain scans. Oh my goodness, the brain was lit up. The intuitive part of the brain, the creative part of the brain, the learning part, the doing part, the ha emotions of happiness, it was all there, joy. Then they took them back in, same 30 people, and said, what ifs? What if your dog died? What if you were diagnosed with a bad disease? What if somebody stole all your money? What if your house burned down? What if, what if, what if? Then they did brain scans. The only things that were lit up was worry, anxiety, and fear. Oof. When we are in gratitude, we cannot have negativity around us. So when we start feeling a little bit down or feeling like we're not living our purpose, go to gratitude. A grateful mindset will allow new opportunities to come to you. And as you grow, just like a plant, it grows big, it gets repotted. You get a new opportunity. By the way, to make a plant grow big, <laughs> you don't scream at it and say, hey, grow. You put fertilizer on it, which a lot of us have a lot of fertilizer in our life being dumped on us right now. Yet, can we look at it as growth? Can we look at it as the way that God is growing us into something that will have more and more opportunity instead of the poor woe is me and look at where I'm at? No, nope. it's just growth opportunity and it's challenging. But whoever said life was going to be easy, it's simple, not easy. Hmm. We get to decide, be it birth, death, choice. And I know I've taken a lot of your time and uh, I so appreciate being able to be on the podcast and I just trust somebody got something out of it. Oh, uh, that's for sure. I mean, I got something out of it and that's great. So I think to me, to to wrap up our conversation, I would love to kind of like say my my feedback, my, my takeaway in a sense is it's the why at least for you it's adding value so that was super helpful and that you look for that every day i mean there's so much depth into just those two things you know adding value to people because becoming more in that light to me makes a lot of sense especially as a follower of christ and 
I mean, that's that's kind of like my big takeaway. And I wish, I mean, I, I almost have like another thought idea, but I think it's going to be too long. But I'm just going to mention it and see <laughs> and see what happens. Right? Uh, we don't need to to like go deep on this. But I love that idea because you mentioned in the book too, and I've been wrestling with that. And maybe this is my final uh, question: is the idea of almost like hitting a ceiling, right? When when there's that leadership principle that um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I've been wrestling with that idea a lot because I have encountered myself almost like I've tried changing things and changing methods and, and saying, okay, I'm hitting a ceiling. How can I do it in a different way? And even with my own podcast, you know, that's why now I have emojis and I used to have them at the beginning. Now I do them at the end. So I'd shift a lot and, you know, creating even like, cause this whole journey of having Christian podcast.com has been a journey itself, you know, and, and I almost wish it wasn't a, um, Like I, I didn't get to where I wanted when I wanted. It's taken years and years and years, right? And and I'm okay with that process because I've learned a lot. But at the same time, I wrestle with that idea of like, man, sometimes you you change things and you're still hitting a ceiling, right? So what do you have to say to just just quickly, you know, to that idea of of uh, I don't know. Do you? I mean, I guess you agree because you have it on your book. But it's not that I disagree. It's just <laughs> that sometimes I feel like, ah, it's it's got to be more than that because I've tried changing and it doesn't help that much. <laughs> or is it in the long run? Or what's <laughs> you? You've done great. You've done great. You at the more and you're right. This book it does help. Right. Uh, it does give a step by step guide as to what we can do. And it's a journey. It really is a journey. But when we look at life as a process, which you have, you're always progressing. And look at how far you've come. Sometimes we keep thinking, oh, we've got to do more. And it's about becoming more in order to do more because our business grows to the extent that we do. So to wrap this up, I want you to go back, Beto, and look at how far you've come. I think you'll probably be very surprised. And that glass ceiling that we hit, it's becoming the floor you stand on. And when you go back and you look, I'll bet you on every one of those things that you did, you literally, the ceiling you were going for is now the floor you were standing on. And it's because you put a new ceiling there. And so you are growing. Just go back and see. I'll bet you <laughs> 10 to 1 that you have grown tremendously. And as you have, your podcast continues to grow. So congratulations on everything that you're doing. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Awesome. Thank you, Diana. Okay, so we're going to yeah, wrap the, the episode. Buy the book. <laughs> yes, we'll get to that just real quick. Let's go to our emojis to wrap up the episode. So now you're going to walk through the five emojis and either recap or think of the future. Okay, so when you think about um, becoming more, what is the worst idea out there? The one you would say, that's blasphemous, that's far-fetched, that's, that's ungodly even. What I would say? Yes. Are you asking them? Oh, <laughs> I would say that, that you should live in the world would be the most ungodly thing to say. Don't, don't live in the world. Don't worry about what other people are doing or saying just focus on god he's there for you skeptical where do you see skepticism played out or what are you still skeptical of oh i think skepticism comes actually from social media a lot we we look at how many likes we have and we start comparing ourselves with others so skepticism goes into our own mind and we have a storyteller in our mind and when we start telling ourselves story uh we're not very confident inspired emoji where do you see hope or what inspires you Just the mere fact that I wake up every day is inspiration because God, Albert Einstein said, you can live your life two, one of two ways, that nothing is a miracle 
or that everything is a miracle. I choose the last. Everything's a miracle, so go find yours. Love it. A holy idea according to Diana Kakowska. Trust in God. His word is perfect. He is perfect. And live his word. And the final one is a divine idea. What is the highest idea you can think of? Well, the Trinity is the highest. I mean, honor God in everything. If you get a standing ovation, they're not doing that for you. They're doing that for the gift God gave you. Just always give the honor and praise to Him. He's there. Lovely, 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 lovely. Thank you so much, Diana. Okay, now is the time to plug your book where you want to point people to your website, your, I don't know, social medias. Oh, it would be becomingmorebook.com. Becomingmorebook.com. On social media, follow me on dianakakoska.com. Uh, Instagram, diana.kakoska. That's K O K O S Z K A. And of course, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, all sorts of places. Nice. Okay. Well, there you have it, my friends. Thank you for being on this episode of Christian podcast.com i hope you enjoy this show and i'm gonna ask that if you like this show rate it review it give us a positive five star review no less than that otherwise move on to the other podcast <laughs> okay and um share this episode with a friend okay we're on every single platform but the easiest way to find us is at christianpodcast.com i'll see you guys on the next one okay let's party it out <laughs>